Church, I'm excited to be here with you today. If we haven't met, my name is Jody. I'm one of the pastors here at Brentview, and I'm just, I'm excited to be here. We're going to have a good morning together, um, and we're going to talk about some truth. Um, I don't trust my computer to not die, and actually after Kurt's notes crapped out that one week, I'm like, I've got my hard copy here just in case, but we're going to try it out <laughs> with the laptop. Um, Anyways, it's going to be good. If you are new to Brentview, if you're wondering how to get connected here at Brentview, um, and you're in the building, there's a, Q, uh, sorry, a Connect card in the pew in front of you with a QR code on it. You can scan that, fill out the card. We want to get to know you, um, and we'd love to help you get connected. If you're joining us online, very similar instructions. Head to brentview.church and go to the I'm New tab, and the Connect card is there um, for you. But we'd just love to to get to know you um, and help you get connected into the life of Brentview. There's a lot going on here right now. Um, we are currently in week four of a five-week series called Vivid um, that Pastor Kurt has been walking us through. So if you're just joining us this week for the first time, maybe head back and watch the first three because um, this is all kind of connected here. But the whole series is an invitation, um, and it's a call to fix our eyes on Jesus and see him clearly. And then we'll be, we've been packing, unpacking all of the things that get in the way of us seeing him clearly. Right? So Kurt's talked about the external influences that warp our perception of God. Um, we've talked about how we were built for intimate, intimate relationship with God, but sin disrupts that shalom, right? that perfect peace between God and man. And last week he talked about how we need to uh, expand our imaginations and use that. It's a gift we've been given to see God in a way that our eyes can't. And today I want to walk through seeing God as a friend. Which sounds simple, but it's not. <laughs> and we're going to talk through it a little bit more, because what does that mean, and what are the challenges that get in the way, and how in the world does that change our lives? So if you do have a Bible with you, or if you're at home and you want to grab yours, we're going to head to Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 13. Um, we'll be there in a few minutes. So you can get that ready. Um, let's, you know what, we're going to jump right in. Here we go. I'm going to give away the ending. Are you guys ready? <laughs> Jesus wants to be your friend. Jesus desires that our belief in him will develop into a friendship. And there's an idea out there, there's a teaching belief in and out of the church that, that God's relationship with us is purely transactional, right? And maybe this is how you were raised, or maybe this is something you were told. The idea that, well, okay, I believe in you, and for some reason that makes God happy, so check mark, eternity is secured. Uh, I'm good to go. I'll just live my life, maybe follow a few rules as long as they're not too intrusive. Um, and then I'll talk to you again when I die, Lord. Thanks. But it's just not true, and it's frankly uh, wildly unbiblical. <laughs> There's um, a quote from author and philosopher Dallas Willard that says it this way. He says, There is absolutely nothing in what Jesus himself or his early followers taught that suggests you can just decide to enjoy forgiveness at Jesus' expense and have nothing more to do with him. It's not the way it works. And we talk a lot about discipleship here at Brentview. Every person making disciples, it's a value that we hold. And the desire of our hearts as leaders here is that we as a church family and that you as part of that family would be growing closer as a disciple of Christ. And a disciple's a close companion, right? Someone who's in the nitty-gritty, following and studying and imitating their teacher with the intention of becoming like them. So as disciples of Christ, we are to imitate and follow and study Jesus in order to become like him, learning the ways of godliness and how to experience life in the full. And Jesus modeled this for us, right? While on earth, he had disciples, a few that he called to leave everything and literally physically follow him. He poured into them and he taught them and he revealed who God is, right? In John 14, Jesus is talking with his disciples and one of them, Philip, asks him to show them God. He says, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And Jesus replied, have I not been with you all this time, Philip? And yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the perfect reflection of God the Father. And what we see in the life of Jesus is a closeness, a God who draws near, and a God who desires relationship. A little bit later in John 15, Jesus says, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what his master is doing. 
but I've called you friends. For all that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. God's not looking for slaves. He's not looking for impersonal obedience or blind obedience. He desires friendship and closeness and intimacy. So let's dive into our scripture passage this morning because it's just a fantastic example of, of what I'm talking about here. Um, a little bit of preference or pref- preface? There we go. Preface. Um, it starts with on that same day. So I just want to kind of fill you in on what day we're talking about. Um, this is Resurrection Sunday. So when we enter in our passage this morning, Jesus has risen from the dead. Um, <clears throat> sorry, the women have gone to the tomb. They found it empty. The angel has appeared to them and said, hey, Christ is risen, and they've run back to go tell the disciples. And this is kind of where we're entering in this story. So let's read it together. It says, On the same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you talking about as you walk along? And they stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who's unaware of the things that have taken place out there over the last few days? Kind of a where have you been moment. And he said to them, what things? And I love that. Do you think that's like cheeky Jesus? And he's like, oh, what things? (laughs) I just think it's so funny. Um, Well, what things? He said to them, the things about Jesus of Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago, but there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who had told them he's alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had said. They didn't see him. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going ahead, but they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It's nearly evening, and the day's almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, Weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? And we're going to end there. <clears throat> There's a lot here. <laughs> so we're going to break it down. Um, first, I want to say that recognizing Jesus can be hard. We've all had experienced a time where we've looked back and thought, oh, if only I'd known, or man, if I'd known that, or known then what I know now, I would have, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. Hindsight's a game changer. But in the moment, and in the middle of the struggle, and the hopelessness, or whatever the situation may be, it's difficult to see God, let alone believe that he's close. Verse 21, uh, the men said to Jesus, we had hoped he was the Messiah. We had hoped. Right? Everything they had waited for and had placed their hope in had been destroyed, literally killed and buried, and was gone, or so they thought. Right? And they were walking hopeless blinded by circumstances and what seemed real or realistic. And Jesus meets them there. He meets them in the hopelessness, and he says, you foolish people. And I like to imagine that's like an endearing kind of way, you know, that like head shake and a deep sigh, like, ah, you foolish people. Man, when are you going to get it? Right? He's like, I told you. I've been telling you for years. You don't see. And then Jesus does something absolutely profound. He walks with them. He takes time. Jesus, who has just risen from the dead, (laughs) takes time to walk with them in their hopelessness. I have a very dear friend named Carrie. I want to tell you about her. (laughs) Uh, We were roommates in Bible school back in 2007, and it was like instant friendship. I knew from day one that we were going to be tight. 
Um, and after some years, Carrie and I ended up both living in Calgary and both attending U of C. And school went really well for Carrie. Um, she did great. She's a hard worker. Um, she's brilliant and driven. So she graduated, and then she did her teaching degree, and then she went on to teach high school. Um, I, however, uh, struggled really hard in school. Um, some of the struggle was circumstantial, but a lot of it was my fault. Um, I got into this horrible spiral of not prioritizing school as it deserved to be prioritized, um, and then feeling guilty about it and doing, doing worse because guilt is a terrible motivator. Um, and it just started to drag on and on. School became this horrible, like, shame-filled experience. And I hated talking about it. I would joke about it all the time, right? People would be like, oh, how's school going? And I'd be like, oh, it's fine. I may never graduate. <laughs> um, and you'd put the face on. But truly, it was horrific. Um, and I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know how to move forward. Uh, I didn't know how to quit without carrying that kind of failure. Um, but I, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to finish. Um, I didn't know how to figure out the next step. And then Carrie stepped in. So at this point, she has two kids under two. She's busy. Her youngest is just a few months old. And Carrie walked with me. So if you're a parent of young children or you've had young children, you know that being a friend in that season is really hard because there's a lot going on and your plate is full. Um, but she found care for her daughter and she strapped her few-month-old son to her um, and she came with me to see the academic advisor. And she did it without judgment and I never felt like she was ashamed of me, like I was ashamed of me. And she just walked with me. And I did it. That meeting changed it for me. I figured out what the end was, and I completed it, and it was amazing. It was a miracle, and we celebrated hard. Um, and I wanted to share that story, not to build up Carrie or just to share my shame, but because a healthy human friendship is a shadow and a taste of the deep friendship that Jesus offers. Right? So when I imagine friendship with Jesus, I can remember Carrie sitting next to me in that office and facing with me that thing I was so scared of. Jesus met these men in their despair and in their hopelessness. He walks with them. And then he calls them to remember. Right? Can you imagine that conversation? I just, oh, I wish it had been written down. I truly do. Walking with Jesus and having him explain to you where he shows up in all of Scripture would have been absolutely miraculous. Um, the author, Rachel Held Evans, has a little excerpt in her book called Inspired. And it's so beautifully written. And she's, she's talking about God's faithfulness. So it doesn't completely 100% translate here, but it's just a beautiful, almost poem. Um, and I want to share it with you because I think it gives us a taste of maybe what that conversation looked like. So she says, Remember how in the beginning God put everything in order and made the whole cosmos a temple? Remember how we're created in God's image as stewards, not slaves? Remember how Adam and Eve disobeyed and how Cain and Abel fought? How all the people of the earth grew so rebellious and cruel that God regretted creating the world in the first place? Remember how one family's faithfulness was enough to save them from the great flood? Remember how God promised an elderly Abraham his, his descendants would outnumber the stars? Remember how Sarah laughed? Remember how God chose a people, a peopleless nomad, a second-born stud, son, a stuttering runaway, and a little shepherd boy to create, liberate, and rule a nation? Remember how that nation is named for a man who limped from wrestling with God? Remember how God saw the suffering of the banished Hagar, the unloved Leah, and the oppressed Hebrew slaves? Remember how Pharaoh's mighty army drowned in the sea? Remember the desert? Remember the manna? Remember the water from rock? Remember how it's our God who says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Remember how this God has been faithful. Can you imagine that conversation of Jesus walking through and saying, Do you see me? Do you see me? I've been here. I've been here the whole time. And these men would have been so familiar with the scripture, which is the other cool part. It's that not like, Oh, this is all new information. It's like, Look at what you know and see me in it. And maybe as they walked, maybe they started to catch on, and the connections were starting to come together in moments of revelation that like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that makes sense. And circumstances that seemed 
completely removed and against the plans of God start to become clear. It's hard to recognize Jesus, but the longer we walk and the more we remember, the easier it becomes. And God knew this from the beginning. The call to remember is all throughout scripture. It's why we gather as a church body. It's why we do communion. It's why we give a portion of our income. It's a call to remember. Remember, God is close. Remember, he cares that you're surrounded by community. Remember, he cares that you have enough. Remember, he died so he could be in a relationship with you. Do this in remembrance of me, he says. In the scripture today, he broke the bread at the meal they had together. And in that moment, they saw him for who he was, the risen Messiah. And as we habitually remember, it gets easier to translate that into the everyday. When parents want to dedicate their child, I ask them to take some time and meet with me. And we talk through what partnership between parents and church looks like. And what I like to do is explain why we do some of the things we do in kids' ministry. Um, give them some, some background. What's the motivation? And I'm going to give you a little, uh, little insight into that conversation. <laughs> so for a large group, when we share a Bible story, what I really want the kids to understand and walk away with is who God reveals himself to be in that story. Right? I have very little interest um, in kids memorizing facts and names just for its own sake. Not that those are bad things, it's just not the point. Um, and I don't want them to just know like, who Daniel is. I want them to know the God that's going to show up in the lion's den or in the fire. Right? And I don't want them to just know that God calms storms. I want them to know that he's powerful, more powerful than the storm. Right? And I, I want them to know that God calls his disciples by name. Because if that was true then, and God is unchanging, then maybe he can show up for me like that, show up like that for me too. What a great lesson for a kid to learn from the get-go. I want us to have that same mindset when reading scripture. Who is God in what I'm reading? And can I hold on to that truth in my current circumstances? And it's hard. Friends, it doesn't take five minutes on social media or on the news for discouragement to rear up. I know I'm not alone in this. In fact, I know a lot of you are going through really hard things right now. And our prayers echo the cries of generations before us, and we yell, where are you, Lord? Don't you see? It feels big and out of control. The world's a mess. People are in pain. Relationships are broken, and anger is so loud. How can it get better? So I want to call us to remember right now. Um, Let's mark a moment. Someone gave me Kleenex. That was nice. (laughs) Where you're sitting, think of a moment where God was there for you, where God felt close. Because he is a God that draws close whether it feels true or not. And we're a reflection of that closeness to a broken world around us. So we need to pray. Um, I'd like to take a moment right now. I don't know what kind of a week you've had, um, but I can safely guess that for many of you, it's been really, really hard. Uh, There's a song I've had on repeat. I love that you quoted a song, Michelle. That's totally how I think, too. (laughs) Um, There's a song I've had on repeat by Elevation Worship, and it's called Same God. And I, there's some of the lyrics are just this beautiful prayer, and I'd like to um, read it as a prayer together because it just declares who God is, and the more we do that, the deeper it gets, right? Um, So would you pray with me? Lord, we cry out to you, God. And you heard your children then, and we ask that you hear your children now. You're the same God. You were providing then, and you are providing now, because you're the same God. You moved in power then, God. Move in power now. You are the same God. You were a healer then, and you're a healer now. You were a savior then, and you are a savior now. You are the same God. So we remember who you are, and we declare who you are. Thank you, Lord. 
Amen. Also know that he is a God who feels pain, your pain. He's a God who mourns. Um, we have a series coming up soon that I'm very much looking forward to where we're going to talk in detail about how we have a God that weeps with us and a God that has space for a lament. And there's comfort in that. So look forward to that. <laughs> but his response to us when we cry out, don't you see, Lord, don't you know? He does see, he does know, and his heart breaks with us. Hmm. Um, there's mystery in that. Wonder and mystery are, are central to growing as a companion of Jesus. Because we're living in the middle, right? We're in the yes, but not yet. The battle is won, Christ is risen, Jesus is king, but the pain is not over. And the world has not been made right yet. And Michelle shared about the disappointment and the rejection she felt when the person who was supposed to be there for her, who was supposed to love her unconditionally, let her down. And I think we can all relate in some way to what she shared. It's so real. It's so in your face. It's hard to give space to imagine a God that cries with you in that disappointment. So we put our hope in things that are physical and right in front of us, right? People and money and stuff, things we can see and touch, the tangible. And for some of you, you're probably struggling with hearing about God feeling close. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> God is a friend? Like, no. Maybe that hasn't been your experience. Because a more comfortable view of God is that he's big, right? He's majestic. He's powerful. And he is. He's all those things and more. And that distance makes sense, right? God is up there. I'm down here. He doesn't bug me. I don't bug him. We're fine. But it's not the gospel. The wonder and mystery of the gospel is that God, huge, powerful God, bigger than time or space, humbled himself. He became human. He drew close and experienced hunger and pain and rejection and exhaustion and death to know you. It doesn't make sense, right? I bring nothing to the table. I find myself more and more being like, really, Lord? <laughs> really? Why? Why me? Why humans? We're such a mess. Why do you even bother? And the mystery that we have to accept is that even though I have nothing to offer, and with my best efforts, I could never earn a relationship with God. But I don't have to earn it. It's a free gift, ready to be received. And with that acceptance that I won't fully grasp it, with wonder and with awe, my friendship with Jesus can deepen. I remember the first time someone told me that Jesus liked me. Like, it blew my mind. And if you grew up in the church, you know Jesus loves you. You hear it, we sing it, we memorize it over and over and over again. Jesus loves me. But I didn't know Jesus liked me. And maybe you don't know that either. I'm going to quote Dallas Willard again, because I love the way he words it. He says, We must understand that God does not love us without, without liking us through gritted teeth, as Christian love is sometimes thought to do. Rather, out of the eternal freshness of his perpetually self-renewed being, the Heavenly Father cherishes the earth and each human being upon it. The fondness, the endearment, the unstintingly affectionate regard of God towards all his creatures is the natural outflow of what he is to the core, which we vainly try to capture with our tired but indispensable old word love. And maybe some of you see your relationship with God this way. You accept the idea that he loves you, but it's almost begrudgingly, right? Like he's obligated. But every time you mess up or you do something less than perfect, uh, you imagine that, that disappointed face or the fake smile or, as Dallas said, the, the love through gritted teeth. It's just not true. He likes you. He delights in you. It's amazing. It's amazing. Man, and it does, it requires imagination, right? Friendship with Jesus requires an increasing liberation of our imagination. I was reading this sermon to my sister last night to get some feedback, and she was like, yeah, it's fine, but how? She's like, how? Like, I know God is there, I know he's consistent, but I'm not consistent, so how do I show up? So helpful, thank you. Maybe you were thinking the same thing. <laughs> so this is where imagination becomes such a helpful tool. 
right? Imagine Jesus next to you. In the littlest mundane moments, washing dishes, at work, driving in your car. Actually, Pete was sharing recently um, about how when he's driving, he imagines Jesus in the passenger seat. And I remember being immediately feeling so guilty because I was like, oh, like I'm not road ragey, but like sometimes I get mad, right? And maybe I express that verbally in my car to people around me. And I was like, ooh, if I imagine Jesus next to me in the car, how would that change my driving experience, right? It's that easy and also that hard. <laughs> I was seeing a, a spiritual counselor for a while, 10 out of 10 experience, highly recommend. Um, and she would start most calls by asking me, where is Jesus in the room and what's his posture towards you? Right? It's this invitation to use my imagination in that moment. And I was always sitting on his lap, always curled up safe like a little kid. But I expected his posture toward me to be anger or disappointment every time. And then through my gift of imagination, Jesus shows me not only is he not angry or disappointed, but he's a comforting father. What was so amazing about spiritual counseling was it's a specific time set aside to be quiet and notice Jesus. Busyness is such a huge problem, friends. Busyness gets in the way of the space we need to imagine. I don't think we fully understand how problematic it is, and we might not for a while. But I think we got a glimpse of it when the world shut down two years ago. Because what I heard from families at the beginning was relief. A lot of we are enjoying being home. It's so nice to be together. It's so nice to not run from this to this to this to this. There was a, a sigh, almost. Um, I think many of us here may have experienced some relief when the busyness was taken away. So let's practice. Let's not rush back to busy. Because practice becomes habit, which builds muscle memory. Right? So if you invite Jesus into the normal over and over again until you don't even have to think about it anymore, you know his presence. You're familiar with him in the room. Jesus walked endless miles with his disciples traveling from place to place. If you've worked with kids or with teens, or maybe you just have really introverted friends, you know well that doing a mindless activity, like walking or driving, leads to some of the best, deepest conversations, rather than sitting and like staring them in the eye across the table. Some of my favorite moments in ministry have been sitting on the floor coloring, or driving youth to an event, or going for a walk. Right? Those are holy moments. And Jesus wants to meet you in those moments, too. You just need to invite him in. So next time you're doing busy work, which will be today, so do it today, intentionally ask Jesus, what do you want to say to me? And see what happens. When I was in grade 7, I went to uh, summer camp, and I hated summer camp. I'm not built for it. Um, but one night in chapel, I'll never, I'll never forget it, as long as I live, grade 7, the speaker led us through an imagining activity. So we had to close our eyes, and we had to picture Jesus across the room, and you imagine him walking closer and closer and closer to you, until the speaker was like, he's now he's, he's uncomfortably close, like he's in your bubble. And then suddenly you're nose to nose with Jesus, and we're sitting there, we're all imagining this, and then he goes, and then he speaks to you, and went silent. And that was the first time I heard God speak. And it blew my grade seven mind. I'm not going to tell you what he said, but it was incredible, and I'll never forget it, and it's gotten me through a lot. It was a gift, right? Our imaginations are this beautiful gift and a way for us to connect with Jesus who's there. We just can't see him physically. And noticing Jesus changes everything. You might be thinking, okay, all right. Jesus wants to be my friend. He's proven himself. To be a God that draws close, I don't understand it, but for some reason he likes me. That's all very nice. So what? Here's why this is life-changing information. <laughs> because these truths lead to freedom. Like, absolute freedom. There's thoughts from two authors I want to share with you, and they're a little long, so you'll have to forgive me, but they're just so beautifully done. So author Sky Jathani says, Why is it so difficult for self-identified Christians to believe let alone obey what Jesus said. Well, if they still see the world as fundamentally, a fundamentally dangerous place in which their well-being is in constant jeopardy, then the call to love your enemy, give freely, and not worry can only be dismissed as ludicrous. 
It's only when we live with God and come to experientially know his goodness and love that the shadows break and these commands begin to make sense. If I am eternally safe in the care of my good shepherd and I come to see the world as a safe place, then I'm set free from my fears. I'm free to give rather than hoard. I'm free to enjoy each day rather than worry. And I'm free to forgive others rather than retaliate against them. And I'm even free to love the person determined to harm me. But all of it starts with trust or faith in God's ever-present love and care for me. In a very similar note, uh, author Mark Buchanan in his book God Walk says, maybe that's how any of us gets free from our pettiness, free from our thin skins, free from our need to be admired by others, free from our craving to be better than others, Maybe the only way any of us gives up a piece of ourselves, even our swords, is by a long way walking with the one who gave himself up, even his own life, just to make us his treasure and make us like he is, to make us a royal priesthood. Maybe no one truly becomes themselves wholly, freely, unreservedly, not needing to be anyone else until we walk long enough with Jesus that we become as he is. I think there's something profound and holy in that walk, that time set aside in the normal to just be more like Jesus. And seeing Jesus as a friend, a friend who meets us in our hopelessness, who walks with us in our confusion and gives us milestones to remember, leads to a life of freedom from the need to perform or earn so we can be generous and we can love freely and we can forgive, and we can pray for a broken world and the people around us who do not know the life-changing gift God has to offer. We can be the friend who sits in the shame of another. It's the hope we can offer a broken world. God draws close, let me show you what that looks like. And freedom to just be with God, to sit and walk and play and eat with our companion, Jesus Christ, to be holy yourself and wholly loved. And as we walk and play and talk and eat, we're transformed. We start to look more and more like him. And it becomes easier to see him in the everyday, totally normal moments and to serve out of an overflow, not an attempt to earn anything. I'm gonna wrap up here real quick. Pete's going to lead us in worship, and Kurt's going to lead us through communion. But there's an invitation here for us. Do you believe that Jesus likes you? Do you believe that he's close? Like a perfect friend. And maybe this is new for you, and you aren't sure about Jesus or what following him is all about, and that's totally okay, and your questions are so welcome here. And I hope you feel a stirring in your heart, like the disciples who heard Jesus unpack scripture and they felt a burning. They knew they were listening to truth. So I'd invite you to ask Jesus to show you how close he is, because it might surprise you. And maybe this isn't new for you at all. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus for years, but the reality of the pain surrounding you is overwhelming, and it's wearing, and maybe you're exhausted. And I can empathize with that. So I invite you to pray the same prayer. Ask Jesus to show you how close he is. Pray for eyes to see his presence right there in the middle of all the hard, next to you, mourning with you. I invite you to find a way to remember his character and fix your eyes on it. And my prayer for all of us as a body is that we would grow to simply be with Jesus. That all that we do would come from an overflow of his strength and his passion and his love, and that we would all come to look more and more like him as we do life together. It's exciting. Oh, friends, okay, would you play with me? Let's pray. Father, you are so good. Thank you that you are a God that draws close. Thank you that we don't have to search hard to find you. God, I pray you would be close today, right now. Would you help us remember who you are? Remember that we can rely on who you are. 
and that you've proven yourself time and time and time again. Father, would we rely on that? Father, I would pray that you would speak to individual hearts today, God. Tell them what they need to hear. Help us imagine you. Help us imagine you in the room and what your posture is towards us. God, that you meet us with love and not shame or guilt or despair. You are good, even when it doesn't feel good. Lord, we love you. We love you in your name. Amen. Amen.